Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and I bring you this podcast every week on Wednesday as veterinarians and technicians in general practice to make your dentistry service the best it can be. This week, we're going to be talking about some changes in some nomenclature uh, surrounding gingival masses and how we can approach those in general practice from a diagnostic and a treatment standpoint. Let's talk about what the classic nomenclature has been in this space for a gingival mass. Many of you, if not all of you, are associated with the term epulous in your exposure to cases of oral masses in practice. And classically, we've seen three designations that were termed epulous depending on the characteristics of those masses from a histopath standpoint. The first being a fibrominous epulous, the second being an ossifying epulous, and then an acanthomatous epulous. So when we excise masses in the oral cavity associated with the gum tissue, these are the most common that you're gonna see, and these are what we've been exposed to, and they're treated differently depending on which one we're dealing with. That being said, most recently, we've had a couple of name changes that you should be aware of. Now, you likely are going to see your histopath come back as a peripheral odontogenic fibroma, or POF, if you're dealing with the fibrominous epulis or the ossifying epulis. Now, the POF, or peripheral odontogenic fibroma, is used to characterize the fibrominous epulis. And then that same term with a qualifier is used to categorize the ossifying epulis, and that being peripheral odontogenic fibroma ossifying. So those are the terms that you're going to see now. And whether it is the first type or the second type just depends on whether there is bone associated with the gum tissue with either of these. And you've seen this in practice where you've gone to excise one of these masses with a scalpel and underneath that mass, it's rock hard, it's bone, and you can't readily excise it because it is thick bone underneath that. So that is the difference between approaching either of these, or one of the differences between approaching either of these depending on which in practice. So to confound things a little further, and I really don't think that this term is going to take off, but it has been used in several occasions recently that I've seen, and so you need to be aware of it. The first two, POF or POF ossifying, can be termed now, based on their histopath, fibrominous hyperplasia of the gingival ligament. And where this comes from is Cindy Bell, who is the world's foremost oral pathologist for our canine and feline patients or our veterinary patients in general, who does nothing but oral pathology has used this term based on where that mass is originated from. We have traditionally thought of those two masses coming from the periodontal ligament, and consequently, in order to, in theory, remove the entire mass, we have to remove the tooth associated with the mass as well. That appears not to be the case anymore. The tissue, the gingival ligament tissue or the gingival tissue that uh, these arise from is not necessarily the periodontal ligament and is most likely not the periodontal ligament. 
So depending on the involvement of the attached gingiva, we can treat these in two different ways. So let's look at a situation where we have a, a, a case where we've got involvement of only a small amount of the margin of the gingiva. In other words, think about a canine tooth and the canine tooth gingival anatomy. You've got that large width of a zone of attached gingiva adjacent to the canine teeth, especially in the maxilla. And then you have that line that separates the attached gingiva with the unattached gingiva called the mucogingival line. And if you have a mass that involves all but two millimeters or more of that attached gingiva, it's possible that you can remove just the mass and a small amount of attached gingiva and not have to remove the entire tooth. And that's our goal. When we look at these, can we remove them without having to extract the tooth? And that's a, a bit different than it has been approached in the past. So take note of that. If you have a mass that affects the entire attached gingiva, then the only way to excise that and get all of it is to remove the attached gingiva adjacent to that tooth. And doing that renders that tooth an extraction. Anything apical to that mucogingival line from a periodontal standpoint renders that tooth an extraction. Same thing here, if we remove the attached gingiva adjacent to a tooth, we have to extract that tooth. So that would be a circumstance where you definitely need to remove that tooth. If you have an ossifying epulis in either one of those circumstances, you treat that exactly the same way. However, if it's a POF ossifying that does not involve enough gingiva to extract the tooth, you can still remove the entire gingival mass and then contour that bone and close a small gingival flap over that contoured marginal bone. Those become a little bit more challenging surgically, but that's still a possibility in, in many cases. So let's back up a little bit and reintroduce the third of those circumstances before we go on to give you a couple of more examples of how we might approach these. And that is the acanthomatous epulis with the previous nomenclature, which is now the canine acanthomatous amyloblastoma. Those are often cauliflower-like. They're more proliferative. They do involve bone in many cases, and that bone can be proliferative, but most often it is destructive. But it can be proliferative and destructive. Further classifying those are the less common conventional acanthomatous amyloblastoma and the amyloid producing amyloblastoma, both of those tend to be cystic and can be more aggressive. None of those are where we're going to get metastasis, but they are locally invasive and they are sometimes rapidly advancing. So we wanna get these as soon as we see them and we wanna approach these through referral. These should be mandibulectomies and maxillectomies that are best handled in the hands of a veterinary dental specialist. So these are ones that you would refer. And you may know that this is 
one of these masses because it's a little bit more proliferative and it involves a lot of tissue and a lot of teeth just by visual exam, but you also may be surprised radiographically when you think you have an epulis, especially if it's early and that epulis or POF turns out to be what you feel is a little bit more aggressive and that's where you can biopsy that and subsequently send it to a specialist from that point. So let's go back to those first two cases and look at a specific case where we have the attached gingiva involved adjacent to an incisor. However, excising just that gingival tissue associated with that incisor and creating a flap to extract that tooth is going to result in a very narrow flap with not a good blood supply that is not ideal for closure. So especially when you're dealing with incisors and you have a POF or a POF ossifying that is associated with a, an incisor that impinges somewhat on the two adjacent teeth, we would almost always likely prefer to involve those other teeth in a larger flap, extract the two adjacent teeth, and then close to make a broader base flap with a better blood supply that's much less likely to dehiss. These are more challenging than would be an extraction and a flap on a maxillary premolar, for example, or a couple of maxillary premolars because the unattached gingiva is tightly adhered in the incisor area, maxillary and mandibular with the underlying musculature. So there's a lot of dissection that needs to happen to loosen that mucosa away from that musculature so we can have a tension-free closure with these. So these are not something that you want to do for the first flat procedure that you do in a gingival excision on one of your patients. These take experience with other less involved areas like the maxillary premolar, like the canine tooth, where you are comfortable with closing your general surgical extractions, which again, gets you to the point where you're comfortable with flaps, and then you can more confidently and with less stress and frustration approach these where they do involve much more tissue management in order to close them properly. So to review what we've talked about here, we have the different kinds of epulids that have been reclassified. The fibromatous, the ossifying, and the acanthomatous epulids are now termed peripheral odontogenic fibroma, or POF, and then POF ossifying for those first two. And then those two can be classified further, and you may see this, but I don't suggest that you use this term because the other two terms, the POF and the POF ossifying, are more descriptive and tell you how to handle these clinically, but the FHGL or fibromatous hyperplasia of the gingival ligament encompass the POF and the POF ossifying as one term to describe either one of those. And then you have the canine acanthomatous amyloblastoma. So I hope this has clarified how we approach these now and give you a better idea about how to handle these in practice and how to recognize a canine acanthomatous amyloblastoma versus the other two and be able to confidently refer those to a veterinary dentist. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Vet Dental Show. If you're interested in more of our courses, you can find our online and live courses at veterinarydentistry.net. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Wednesday.